this is the Creative Outlet Podcast Episode 3. I am your host, Brandon Pudwill, and let's see, what is today, the date that I'm recording this? It is February 25th, 2020, uh, which is a Tuesday. Uh, obviously, it's been quite a while since I recorded the uh, second episode, but you know what? I'm here. I'm ready to move on uh, to this third one, um, but you know it's 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 pretty much coming out how I expected it would be going in between episodes here. Uh, they would come out at the pace in which uh, I can make them because other assignments, of course, assignments that will be graded, whereas this obviously isn't an assignment for anyone other than me. Uh, this kind of has to take a back burner, but I am uh, working on this right now, right here, and we're just gonna keep having things go as they are. Um, so what do I wanna start by talking about? Well, why don't we, rather I, I just have a couple of reflections that I wanna share from episode two. So, um, in particular, there's one segment that I wish I had done a little bit better on, which was the uh, game reproduction segment of the episode, which is that I should have clarified that I was focused on the uh, psychology of why you'd want to have a reproduction, or at least that's how I uh, should have introduced it. Obviously, that's uh, kind of how I referred to it in other contexts, and a particular one that I'm going to be discussing here in this introduction. Um, and I was thinking about it because I was watching a segment from the completely unnecessary podcast, which is um, the show that I mentioned in that segment, and I wish I knew the particular segment they did and the name of it so I could link to it. Um, but I, just, I was watching a segment about an illegal reproduction website. Um, you know, if I find that segment, or if somebody knows what that is, please uh, link it. But right now, that exact one isn't coming to mind. And really, the thing that got me thinking about, like, oh man, that's I should have referred to it a little bit differently. It's because of a segment that uh, the hosts, uh, Pat and Ian, mentioned in the segment, which is uh, counterfeit. And I do not and would not, in any circumstance, defend counterfeit products. But uh, the point of that episode, or that segment, is rather that I can see in a few specific scenarios, like with fans, fan-translated uh, cartridges, why one would want to purchase such a thing with the acknowledgement that it is illegal, um, and that the reproduction cannot be resold. Now, that, that's only the that's really the main thing that I wanted to um, uh, reflect on from that first episode. Uh, let's see what other sorts of things are going on. Obviously, I talked about I have classes, and those are really uh, making problems in terms of uh, working on this. So let me just say, in like the last couple of weeks, I've I've translated. Well, I've read more translated Greek than I think I have in my entire life because I have, um, let's see, I read the Greek tragedy Medea um, by Euripides and a bunch of the books, which is just the fancy Greek way of saying chapters um, in uh, Plato's Republic. Um, and it's kind of frustrating because the thing is, so reading ancient translated Greek is not exactly something that I would call super enjoyable. Um, I'm sure there are some people who like it, but it's not really a thing for me. Um, but Medea really wasn't all that bad because the play was written pretty smoothly. And as a reader, it's like, oh, I mean, I can understand, obviously, what's happening here with Medea being all um, angry that Jason is leaving her to marry a princess when they have children together. Uh, whereas Republic is not really written in a uh, reader-friendly way. Uh, let's see, I also read The Prince by Machiavelli, Niccolo Machiavelli, I guess I should say. Um, it's a very interesting read, and it gives you quite a different perspective on who 
uh, Machiavelli was as a person, because, you know, we think of uh, Machiavelli and we think about um, him as, like, this ruthless, do-whatever-you-can-to-get-power sort of guy, and it's not like he doesn't talk about that at all in uh, the text, uh, but he definitely gives quite a few more caveats on, hey, that you really shouldn't use violence, and here are some instances for, or some pretty common and logical instances for why you shouldn't, and I don't know, I guess I just, I don't think people really realize that uh, about him. And then recently I've been reading uh, Leviathan for uh, by Thomas Hobbes for my uh, political science class, which is a class that I read all uh, three Republic Machiavelli's uh, prints and uh, Leviathan for, whereas I'm taking an introduction to theater class. Uh, well, it's introduction to, introduction to theater and dramatic literature, so it counts as like a, a literature type credit. Uh, that's why I read Medea. Um, I also have read a couple more plays. I've read the ancient No play, Atsumori. Very interesting. Very short, actually. Um, and uh, it definitely has a lot of symbolism that I thought. So it's funny. I th a lot of the people who are in the class with me actually didn't find it super clear, but I, I understood it pretty well. Uh, I thought it was very enjoyable. Um, and I've also read the classic French comedy Tartuffe. I also really enjoyed it, uh, even with all of the rhyming in it. I just think that the message in the play about uh, uh, religious hypocrisy and how many problems it can cause is a very interesting, unique, and important message, even in the modern day. Even like, you can just take out the religious part, too, and think about uh, hypocrisy and fakery, and I think that's very relevant to uh, 2020. Uh, and then what else has been going on? I've taken a couple of exams, um, examines de espanol, and uh, uh, so I have a genetics class for, my, uh, for a biological sciences credit. It's pretty interesting as well. I've taken exa an exam in there, did pretty well. Um... I mean, that's how the everyday life here has been going. Uh, let's see, I've also been thinking about doing some things with this show. So obviously, if you have been paying attention to what I've been doing here, um, I started uploading segments from episode two. And uh, at the time of this recording, there should be uh, two more that are going up, two more that are... Uh, scheduled to upload a particular time, um, and it's really interesting. I actually found editing those significantly easier than editing the full supercut of this show, um, but obviously in order to make <laughs> all of these segments, I need to have the supercut complete because I record the whole show in one big, one giant fell swoop. Um, uh, those have been going up. I've been seeing, you know, I'm quite at the start of this, I have fewer than uh, 50 views on everything that I've put up, but you know, uh, things are going pretty well on those, actually, in my opinion, in terms of just being able to produce them and make them at all. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've also been trying to think about other platforms in which I can... Uh, upload this show, particularly the audio portion, because obviously this is a podcast, so I've been trying to look into other platforms. I haven't really chosen any yet. Um, again, graded assignments and studying uh, will take precedence over working on things with this uh, show, but those are all things that are on my brain right now, and um, also looking into the future uh, in terms of episodes and their creation. I, I've already picked the topics for episode four, um, but I actually need to write out notes on things that I want to say about them in order to make <laughs> having them picked out actually be relatively um, effective. Um, but I think that's all I really want to say in this introduction here. So why don't we move on to talking about some of the topics of the day. So 
Uh, if there's something that I certainly don't think I can exemplify uh, enough on this program is that I enjoy video games, and I also enjoy videos and content about video games. So I watch uh, quite a bit of YouTube, as I mentioned in the first episode um, of this show, and uh, something that people have been making quite a few videos about in recent months is uh, the gaming platform that I neglected to mention when I was talking about my favorite one, uh, that being Google Stadia. So I talked a bit about, I just kind of think of it as the Nintendo platform, because they never really have a consistent name, uh, <laughs> um, but they're all obviously made by the same company, and then you have PlayStation and Xbox, but, um, you know, when I was talking about, like, gaming platforms and the ones that I like, I completely forgot to mention Stadia, and, well, let's be real, there's a pretty obvious reason why. So, I guess it would be important to give a little bit, little, bleh, a little bit of background. Uh, Google Stadia is Google's gaming platform, and uh, unlike other platforms where you have a dedicated piece of hardware, uh, be it a console or a handheld device, or of course your personal computer, all you need for Stadia is a wireless controller. Okay, well, you need a controller and one of the many pieces of hardware that your game gets streamed to. Uh, so you can use a smartphone, a Chromecast Ultra, or a PC with Google Chrome on it to play your game. But the thing about the way Stadia works is that you're not really playing the game on your device. Um, because Stadia is one of the first cloud gaming platforms, which immediately gets me into one of the problems that people have with it and why I do not plan in uh, buying into it. So games on Google Stadia cost a uh, full price. But the problem here, um, and actually I guess this problem in particular covers a couple of larger problems of the service, um, Google Stadia has games that are mostly from a, you know, like one or two years ago. Um, and some of those games, like, uh, what's, uh, a good example would be Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2. Um, that's a game that if you just type it into Google here, um, it'll go for 10 to 20 bucks online, um, for a physical copy on the PS4 or, uh, the Nintendo Switch. Now on Stadia, it goes for $50 with no additional content. Now I bring up physical copy in particular um, when talking about uh, Xenoverse 2 for two reasons. First off, to be fair, a digital copy on the Switch is also $50, and a digital copy on the PlayStation 4 is $60, so it's not really like the other platforms are doing any better on their digital storefronts, but considering that you can obtain a copy of the game that you can really choose to do whatever you want with after the fact, you could sell it, you could keep it, you could uh, donate it to someone, you could lend it to a friend, um, or really do uh, anything else to it for 40 to $50 fewer, getting a copy on Stadia is a terrible investment because you lose in multiple aspects. So obviously I talked about paying in full price. Um, and then the second aspect is that if you don't like whatever game you get on it, you're stuck with it. it, it it's yours forever. You can't do anything with it. Um, and that really sucks, because if you don't like it, you should be able to get your money back. If you want to give it to someone, you should be able to do that. But obviously on Stadia, you're just stuck with the game. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's a streaming platform, too, means you don't even really get a copy of the game, which fortunately means you have very fast download times. So they're not really download times, it's just you, pay, you get instant access to the game. Um, but 
you don't really have the games. You can't do anything with it. Um, and then another aspect that, that is tied into uh, one of the problems that people seem to be having with Stadia in general is that Google is known for abandoning services if they don't become obscenely popular right away. I mean, there is quite literally a website called killedbygoogle.com that includes nearly 200 Google products killed. And suffice it to say, um, Stadia sales are not super high. Uh, now, if you go on to... Like, if you have an Android device, you can go onto the Google Play Store, and it has a very cryptic 100,000-plus downloads on the Google Play Store, which sounds like a lot. But just for the sake of comparison, and I know this isn't necessarily an Apple's Apple's comparison, but you're going to see the idea, Google Docs has 500 million-plus downloads. So... Stadia is not exactly selling as many units as Google would probably like it to. Um, it's also very possible that people who've already sunk the 130 some dollars into the system, uh, plus however many, however much money they've spent on games, are going to see that all go away if this doesn't end up being a successful platform. It's just, it's just going to be gone. And that's, uh, that's what I mean. Since it, this is a cloud gaming platform, any games that you are buying, you're not really buying. Um, and while that means you will be able to play the game right away, all you're really doing is being allowed access to the game from Stadia's servers. But if Google kills Stadia and adds it to the graveyard of 200-plus products that are already gone, um, then all that money that you've spent is gone. Because, well, at least as far as I've seen here, right, Google has not said what they would do with games if Stadia were to be discontinued. But to me... So, obviously the fact that we have assumptions about what Google would do, like, oh, maybe they'll all be gone. Or maybe we'll be able to download them after the fact, and they'll be ours somehow. It would probably have to be a PC copy, but then, you know, if your PC doesn't have the power to run the game, then you're still kind of, kind of get screwed over on that now, don't you? But ultimately, we don't know what exactly Google uh, plans to do if they were to discontinue Stadia. And really, that, like, that is more worrying to me than uh, knowing that, or than speculating on what it could be, because realistically, it could be anything. And I would imagine that Google really doesn't want to do the worst case scenario and be like, oh, you know, this platform, we had it here. Uh, no one really bought it. At least no one bought into it as much as we wanted them to. So it's time to pull the plug. But what do we do? Eh, we don't need the games. They gave us the money. It's fine. Like, I would really hope that Google is smart enough to not do that, but, you know, I would probably be, uh, surprised. So either Stadia needs to start doing better, and there's a whole heck of a lot of ways it could be doing better, especially, well, I don't, again, I don't own the platform, so there's definitely quite a few things that I just haven't experienced. Uh, I mean, one of the things I know is, the lineup of games has pretty much stayed the same since November, so if you didn't really care for the lineup in November, why would you care about it at the end of February? Um, that's something that Google needs to improve. They need to get more games on the platform. Uh, there's all of the uh, resolution and frame rate inconsistency. Those are other, That's another thing that people are not 
super into. So if they want to make Stadia a more viable platform, and they, honest to goodness, don't want to kill it, make people mad at them who spent a whole lot of money, they're going to need to make a bunch of changes. And I just don't know how well Google is going to be able to do at making those. I don't know how much I trust them to make those intelligent decisions because ultimately they are a you know multinational multi-billion dollar corporation and they're gonna do what's gonna make them the most money and making the most money is not the same as doing what is right so i don't know we'll just have to see what happens so but I think that's about all I really have to st uh, st say <laughs> about uh, Stadia. Again, don't really. I, I have not done anything with it. I wouldn't even know how to get an activation code. Um, but hopefully, the people that do have it are getting some sort of good use out of it. Um, and ideally, Google will improve the platform for the future so that more people want to uh, see it as a viable option. Um, but yeah, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of factors in the way of doing that, not just with Stadia, but also with uh, cloud gaming as a whole. So why don't we just move on here then. Now for this next topic here, I've decided to do something that's a little personal. Uh, it's still gaming related, but it's a little more personal than normal than it is uh, uh, newsy. So, audience, let me just, why don't I ask this just for funsies. Have you ever watched any uh, Cinemassacre? I know I have. I uh, quite enjoy a lot of the work that that channel does. In recent years, I haven't quite as much, but I know like a good bit of the older work. Um, I've quite enjoyed. And I bring up that channel because of a particular series that the main man, the famous James Rolfe, has done. Um, and for this particular show, I can't name it because, you know, maybe, maybe one day I want the show to be giving me a slight amount of money and uh, I can't exactly give any swearing. But, you know, the... The show is acronymed as YKWBS, which stands for that famous, famous phrase, because I must ask, you know what's BS? Scalpers. Ugh. Scalpers. So, a scalper is an individual who purchases a desired product in excess to flip it for profit. Just so you know, if you've never heard the term, but uh, you're going to learn quite a bit about scalpers here, at least uh, in my experience with them, uh, because I don't like scalpers, and scalpers make me very angry, and I don't like what they do. Um, but most of the time, when people scalp, they think of it for things like concert and sports uh, tickets. So, you know, if, if you've ever gone to like a baseball game if you you'll, you'll like you'll see people outside who are just like standing around selling tickets at a higher price to people than what they would have paid um you know had they just bought the tickets earlier or if they had arrived to the stadium for whatever event uh, is happening earlier um in hopes to get a profit from having bought those tickets and stopping people who wanted to go see the uh, game or concert or whatever it is uh, in the first place. But the thing is, scalpers have also moved their way into uh, other areas, including an area that I'm quite affected by, uh, by going into merchandise for movies, TV, music, and video games. So let's, let me tell my personal story here about scalpers. Um, if you'll remember from the very first episode of this podcast, I discussed some new screenshots about Animal Crossing New 
uh, Horizons. And between that episode releasing and at least uh, my time writing this, a special edition Animal Crossing New Horizons Nintendo Switch was announced. Great! That sounds awesome. Uh, it's got a white uh, dock with an image of uh, an island with Tom Nook and the Nooklings on it, and the actual like Switch tablet console itself has um, special engravings on the back that I think are pretty neat to look like the game. And then the Joy-Con that come with it are like a pastel green and a pastel blue on one side, and then they're white on the other side. It's pretty cool looking, honestly. It's, it, it's, it's really cute. Um, but here's the problem. Scalpers went to buying up these consoles as soon as pre-orders went up. So quite literally, pre-orders would go up for like a couple minutes on a website, and then they were gone. Um, now, fortunately, I am... One of the lucky ones, I will admit. Um, I remember being on uh, the bus one Thursday, tr really trying super hard to get the console for myself and um, my girlfriend. I just got lucky by refreshing the Walmart website over and over and over um, and just barely getting a pre-order in. But... If you're unable to do that, scalpers such as those on eBay would like you to pay $400 to $500 for a guaranteed pre-order for a $300 product. Now I get it. They're trying to make a profit here. They bought a thing. They're like, ah, oh, I don't really want it. So you know what? I'm going to get rid of it by selling it. And you know what? I want to make some money off of it. Which, you know, sounds perfectly normal in other scenarios, but there are two things here. One, the product is not out yet. In fact, now let, let's see. I said it's February 25th. The console releases on... March 13th, 2020, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 17 days away from the date that I'm recording this. So you're trying to sell something for profit that isn't even out yet. I don't know what other people are going to say, Brandon, Brandon, that's capitalism. That's just how it works. You know, you get, you get something, you sell it to make more money. This, 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 uh, no, this is not real capitalism. This is a bastardization of capitalism because there are hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of people who would actually like to have the console and play it. But, but Brandon, it's a limited edition system. It's obviously going to come out in limited quantities. Yeah, I get that. Trust me, I understand, right? I, I know there's going to be a set quantity of these, but there is also a set uh, quantity of people who want it. And those people who want the console, who don't have the time to just sit around at a website for however many hours to continuously refresh it, should not have to pay an inflated price for something that other people, some of which do things like use buying bots, systematically look for these products, and buy them in mass to take them away from people who actually want them. And the really frustrating thing for me is that, you know, this has not only happened with this particular Nintendo Switch console, but it's also happened thing with stuff like uh, the 20th anniversary PS4, right? That was a PS4 that was that was a bright gray to make it look like the original PS1. Um, and it happened with a whole bunch of limited edition 3DS systems. Like The one that sticks out in my mind is the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask 3D new 3DS XL. I'll talk about the different 3DS models another time, but suffice it to say, the new 3DS... Is, does not mean a new 3DS, like it's new in the box, it's new because that's the name of it. It's confusing. Uh, but 
Uh, oh my gosh. That's not even to mention how it happened with a whole ton of waves with Amiibo after they were announced. People talk about the first wave, the first wave of Smash Brothers Amiibo, you know, it had ones that you'd find pretty easily, Mario, Link, Kirby, Pikachu, ones that everyone wants, right? But there were three Amiibo in that wave that were super hard to get. Uh, Wii Fit Trainer, uh, Marth, and Villager, which, funnily enough, should be the Animal Crossing human that you play as. Like, you couldn't find those guys anywhere. And you know why you couldn't find those guys anywhere, other than the people who did want them buying them? It's because scalpers bought them and made them super duper expensive, trying to get you to pay more money to get a whole uh, collection. And, you know, I, it's gotten really, really bad with this particular console, uh, because some people have realized that there are more units in other parts of the world, like Canada, the UK, um, and Germany, and there are people who are trying to buy units from there and uh, have them sent to the U.S. because scalpers keep buying American units. Now, granted, it's not like Nintendo of America should have underestimated how popular the system would be, or you know, they should have prepared in some other way for this, right? Uh, but at the same time, people should also not behave this way. Maybe the sellers like Walmart and Target and Amazon, GameStop. Uh, there's only really one of the Best Buy. Those are like the top five. Like those are the five places you always see on Nintendo's own website if you're looking to buy products. You know, maybe they need rules of like only one unit per debit card or one unit per credit card. Or maybe units should only be sold in stores so that um, retailers can force the one unit per customer rule or something like that. Um, but I'm sure there, that there's certainly ways that people are fine to get around it. And it's frustrating because I got lucky. There's a whole lot of people who were interested in it. That did not get lucky. That are either going to pay the four hundred dollars, or they're going to wait and they're going to say, "Screw it, I don't want it anymore." And it's partially Nintendo's fault. It's partially retailers' fault. It's partially, uh, well, big partially scalpers' fault. And I mean, geez, I'm to the point where it's like, you know, it. This probably sounds silly. I don't. I don't. I don't really know how it would be enforced, but it's like. It almost feels like there needs to be some regulation for this, because if people aren't just going to be moral and be like, oh, well, the only people who really should buy it are the people who want this limited product and pay the intended price, maybe someone's got to step in and be like, no, that's not okay. We're going to make this right. We're going to make it so that at least with limited products like this, um, there's some sort of limitation to make sure that the people who actually want the product get the product. So ultimately, here's the message of this segment. Uh, scalpers are the scum of media, whether it's tickets to concerts, tickets to sports games, uh, buying up limited video game consoles, merchandise, uh, just any sort of limited product like that and they need to find a new way to make honest money because you and I who want to buy products fair and square should always have that opportunity it is that simple there is no no you know discernible reason why anybody should be forced to pay an inflated price on a product because they just don't have the time to get it right away. And actually, I kind of want to go back to that uh, point about the fact that people are finding some in Canada, in the UK, in Germany. Um, 
because I just kind of glossed over it, and I, I think there's an important point to uh, bring up in there, which is we also should not be penalizing people across the world from getting these consoles as well, because there are people in the United States who are just being jerks and aren't letting people get the products they want to get, because like they're perfectly fine happy Canadian people who also want the Animal Crossing Nintendo Switch console and who should be able to spend their money on it and not have, you know, someone who's American buy it out from under their nose and have it sent here. Uh, and, I mean, that's not even getting into, you know, it, it, Canada, it's easy because in Canada they use, uh, well, the same uh, electrical standard that the United States uses. You know, if you're trying to buy this from the UK, or you're trying to buy this from Germany. You know, not only are uh, not only is everything in German if you're trying to set it up, although you can set it to English, so it's fine. But the electrical standard in Europe is not the same as the US, and not not to mention we don't use the same electrical ports, so. Regardless, you have to either buy, you have to buy at least an adapter to take the uh, cord from a European cord to an American cord. Uh, that's the least you have to do. Or if you really want that extra peace of mind, you have to buy a whole adapter converter setup to make the... Just to have that extra peace of mind that... Okay, this is going to work. I'm not going to fry the console. Everything is going to be good. And there's no one who should have to do that either because they should be able to buy their product in their home country for a normal price under all scenarios. I mean, again, I, I get it. It's limited to people who... It's going to be bought by the people who want it. But the people who want it don't always have the time to get it right away. And they don't have the extra money, necessarily, to spend on top of whatever they saved for a limited edition console itself. So, God, I don't know. I don't want to just keep ranting here, because really, if I wanted to, I could probably go on for hours and hours and hours, but it would all just come back to the simple point that uh, scalpers are terrible, I might call them... BS, and you know what the word is, uh, considering that's how I opened up this segment. Um, and something needs to happen so that we, as consumers, are not stuck trying to deal with them when we just want to buy a product. Uh, anyway, now that I'm sufficiently, uh, not, well, I'm riled, but not really riled. Uh, why don't we move on to the third segment of this podcast. Now, this next topic is very much in line with the last topic, but it doesn't have anything to do with scalping in particular, but it it, it has to do with uh, products, gaming products in general, which I don't know how much I've really talked about it on this show, but I enjoy collecting game hardware. Now, I don't want to go for every single piece of hardware and, like, every variant out there. Like, I think about the... Uh, I mean, I have a Nintendo 64 sitting in front of me. I don't really care about having every single color Nintendo 64, but I think they're pretty neat. I, pro I, I would be happy to get one other color of it, just because I think they're neat. Um, but there are certain pieces that I care about. So a great example to me is 
having all the colors of a controller. So yeah, maybe I don't want the, oh, let's see, what are the, let's see, they're called the, oh, Google type the fun pack Nintendo 64. I might be, I might have the wrong word in there. Uh, da, 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 da. Why is that called the fun pack? It's like the uh, other colors of Nintendo 64. Uh, oh, come on. Nintendo 64 colors. Because uh, I know they're under certain series. Uh, if I could just find what they're called, that would be great. Uh, I don't mean this to be like stalling. I legitimately want to want to know the color variants. Uh, I, well, I mean, I know one of them's called like atomic purple, uh, and then there's like a it's not like a neon green. Um, it's like a almost like a watermelony sort of green. Oh, the fantastic. Jungle Green Console. Yeah, that's it. There's a fantastic line. Like, I don't need every fantastic color Nintendo 64, but maybe it'd be neat to have one of the fantastic color controllers, because that's just fun, right? Um, so... When it comes to this sort of collecting thing, I remember there's a particular story that comes to mind. In October, it, well, October is the setup. In October of 2019, the purple and orange Nintendo Switch Joy-Con came out. And there's also like a blue one, the neon yellow one, which is annoying because I would get that if the yellow one that didn't come with it was the right one, because I actually need a replacement uh, left one, but that's uh, not for drift, not for this Joy-Con drift thing, because I haven't, I feel super lucky in that I haven't experienced it. I don't know. Um, but I just, I need a new left neon yellow Joy-Con, but that's a story for another time. Um, and then I, uh, I came home in December, and I remember looking out for Christmas gifts for people with my mom. And I was telling her about how my girlfriend, you know, the one who uh, wants the Animal Crossing New Horizons console that I feel very lucky to have been able to spend the $300 on. Uh, I was telling her about, I was telling my mom about how my girlfriend wants the uh, purple and orange Joy-Con because it, they, it, it's a pretty simple reminder of Halloween. They look spooky and Halloween's her favorite holiday. And I remember my mom saying to me, Brandon, they are, t you know, they're taking advantage of you. Why do you need all of these colors when you're never going to use them? Now, my pragmatic side is in complete agreement. Is there any good reason why I need red Joy-Con and blue Joy-Con and yellow ones and green ones and pink ones and gray ones and like the Smash Bros. ones and the Animal Crossing ones uh, like I talked about uh, not too long ago? Now, in what scenario am I ever going to use all of these controllers or ever have all of them connected, right? Or, you know, just, just for comparison, like... If we're talking about consoles, like what, what about consoles that can only have a certain number of controllers connected at one time? So like the the PS1 and the PS2, for example, those can only use two controllers without purchasing a multi-tap. So why would I get more than two controllers unless I'm going to get a multi-tap, right? And it's, so my argument, I didn't tell her this, but my argument in general in terms of getting, uh, or rather collecting products like this, is about something that I think I've brought up a couple of times on this show, and that is preservation. And I think that's something that a lot of people understand on some level or another, because one day we want future generations to see 
hey, look, this is a game we played in the year 2020. And, uh, you know, this is the thing that we used to play these games with in 2020. And then you, you can just, you can extend that to other parts of the experience too. Like, look at this. There was this particular version of a piece of hardware from this year. Look at this color. Isn't it neat? Some person out there designed this. They made this. And you can extend this out. Like, why would somebody want to collect, um... Amiibo to the extent that I have. It's to make sure that in some time in the future, people can see that video games and toys, they intersected. Because, sure, we can show people photos and, and, and videos of all these things, right? But it's it, it isn't the same thing to just show someone an image of something as it is to let them see the relics from a particular era. It's the same kind like, if you ever go to a history museum, it's one thing to, like, see a picture of a cannon that was used in some old war, I don't know, like the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, if you're talking in the United States. But it's a totally different thing to go there and have behind some velvet ropes the actual, one of the actual cannons from that war. I guess that's just a very different feeling to be like, whoa, that's the thing they used at this point 250-ish years ago, right? That's like, wow, huh, isn't that something? Or uh, to be able to see like an old 1930s car as opposed to seeing an image of a 1930s car. It's very different to be like, huh, like I can see the parts and how they all work, right? And you know, it's uh, it's the same reason, it's the same idea here. It's like, okay, well, um, I don't know. Like, I'm going to use an amiibo again because I think that's relevant. Like, it's one thing for me to show you this nice, cool 8-bit link here in imagery. It's another thing to actually have it in your hand, right? That's the idea. And it's the same reason why, even though it would be... <laughs> much, much more convenient. Uh, I still buy physical copies of games whenever possible uh, because the items that you get with the game are all part of the experience. That was something I was talking about in the uh, psychology of game reproduction segment, right? And that's not to say that every game needs something like a uh, collector's edition that all has all these extras because uh, a bunch of them end up being put up for sale or are just put out for free by uh, local game shops that can't get rid of them um, because they take up like too much space. People are just like, eh, I don't really care that much anymore. Um, but things that came with every game at one point, like the manual, the box art, those are important to preserve because those were a part of the game experience. Um, God, you know, people in, who grew up in the 80s or even the 90s and the 2000s, they talk about being a kid, and it's like, well, I can't play the game because they don't have the system with them. It's a cons it's likely a console game. But yeah, I could flip through the pages of the manual and see the artwork, and it's like, that's neat. It's part of the experience. Um, and I even compared it like uh, with a car, right? If you can get a car from the 1950s in mint condition, that on its own, it's amazing. But being able to get the car... Uh, with the original paperwork in it. Like, you get the 1950s car, and it's like you open up the glove box, whoa, there's a there's the manual in here. Or even things like the paperwork from the person that bought it. That's even better, because you can see the journey that something went on, right? That's what this is all about, is seeing how were things, how are things now. It, actually, it's funny, I, I brought up the why I... Um, still buy physical copies of games. That's why, well, actually, I, I don't buy a ton of digitally, digital download only game, at least some independent games. I buy, I, I certainly buy some. I buy ones that I'm interested in, usually when they go on sale. Um, but sometimes I like to wait. And I like to wait because chances are there will be a 
uh, well, this is something that I want to make a, uh, its own segment eventually, but like there are companies like Limited Run, super rare games that will take independent games and make a limited number of physical copies of them. And it's like, that's great. That's wonderful. I would be, you know, it, uh, sure, I could just download something like, uh, what's good? Uh, like the first one they did was, um, I think it was Thimbleweed Park for the Switch. That was the first Switch release they did. And then a way, way long time ago, they started on PS4 games, right? I don't know. I don't remember which game it was the first one um, for the PS4, but I remember what the first Switch game was, of course. Um, but if I could get it on cartridge as opposed to just putting the data on my system, I would be like, I think it would be way cooler because the cartridge is part of the experience. The 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 little the little teeny teeny A to B D artwork. That's part of the gaming experience there. Um, and it would just be a shame if that was gone. So, uh, I, yeah, that, that's kind of the long and the short of why I think collecting is important. Because, uh, I mean, yeah, practically, pragmatically, it, having a huge collection of the same controller in different colors or, like, with a different picture on it or something like that isn't really practical. But regardless, I would certainly, I would certainly say I'm going to use the whole collection of whatever thing I have at some point because I make a point of using all my goods. Like I don't use it, I don't do this constantly, but I fairly frequently, you know, then at least every, seems like every month, every two months at least, I switch out which Joy-Con I have um, on the side of my Switch just for the sake of it. Because maybe sometimes it's going to look like, ah, you know, I'm kind of sick of the yellow ones. Why don't I go with the blue ones? Eh, blue ones are okay. How about the red ones? I, don't, I mean, I only have red, blue, and yellow, so I can't really do a lot of switching right now. But I use them all. <laughs> um, so while in the short term, it's not very practical to have a collection of anything. I care a lot more about the long term uh, in regard to these products because I care about preserving this history because it like it, it's very similar to the old video games as art sort of argument, um, and that like you want to preserve something that is art, something that somebody went out of their way to create, even if we don't think of the creation necessarily as a traditional art, like uh, painting a painting or, you know, filming a film that, that we've been doing that for over a hundred years. Um, someone put effort into it, someone took the time to design, create, and I want to make sure that future generations see what these people did. And so that is my defense for why I need uh, yeah, red, blue, yellow, green, pink, uh, orange and purple, <laughs> Smash Brothers, uh, Animal Crossing, and probably more <laughs> eventually. Eight plus pairs of Joy-Con and however many Pro Controller variants and whatever other variants of things there are. Uh, because somebody did the hard work to make them and my one day, definitely nowhere near now, uh, grandchildren need to see that somebody made these and the hard work that went into making them. Anyway, why don't we move on to the final topic in this episode? Now, something that I hope I've made pretty clear in this uh, podcasting process is uh, I make it a goal to 
not discuss exclusively gaming topics because, well, for a couple reasons. One, it'll be way too easy for me to do that, right? It's like, oh, well, yeah, game, here's a gaming thing, and here's a gaming thing, here's another gaming thing. That's too easy to do, right? Um, plus, I know that people want a little bit of variety. You don't always uh, care only about video games, and I certainly would not reach nearly as many uh, people as I would like to. If I talked exclusively about video games, it's, it's really that simple, right? Um, so when I was making this episode, I was thinking about, gosh, what, what non-gaming thing do I want to talk about? Que debo hablar sobre? And that's when it hit me. I should talk about something that's constantly on my mind because I'm very, I'm working on it pretty frequently. Mi español, my Spanish. Soy un orador de español. I am a Spanish speaker. It is not my first language, it is my second language. Um, and Spanish is a language that I've been learning since the fourth grade, which is likely earlier than most individuals in the United States. Um, but it, uh, you know, unless it's your first language, then you've been learning it since, um, uh, since birth. Uh, but it seems to me like most people learn a foreign language at the earliest in middle school, at the latest they learn it first in high school in the U.S. Um, I know that some elementary schools have, like, a Spanish club that they, uh, after school, that they teach Spanish in, um, that isn't actually how I got it. I had, uh, Spanish as an actual class, um, but that's a whole separate, longer story about my, uh, my schooling days. Um, but, you know, suffice to say, I've been learning Spanish for quite a while, and I know a good bit about forming the language. Uh, grammar is something that has always been my stronger suit in Spanish. I, I never feel like I know enough Spanish vocabulary. Like, I could figure out how to get by if I were just plopped into Spain, or if I was like, flying and all of a sudden I have been dropped off into, uh, I don't know, Costa Rica or something. Like, oh no, the plane's going down. Ah, like I, I, I could get by. But there are plenty of instances where I would, just, like, I was like, I have no idea what to say because I've never learned the word that I need to use. Like right now, it, it's ironic because I would argue that a bunch of the things that get taught in Spang, Spang, Spanish language classes aren't really as useful as they should be. Like, let's see, I learned about, or rather I'm learning about things like s business stuff, salaries. I was like, that's great, but I don't know how much I'm going to use the word salary, or bonus, or, god, uh, teller in Spanish. It's not to say they have no use, that's not to say I'm never going to use them, but those are words that seem a little bit more superfluous to me than um, words I would use in common contexts. Or even just words that I use all the time. Like, I was just talking a whole heck of a lot about controllers in the last segment, but I have no idea what the word controller is in Spanish. Uh, I mean, what's even a good example of a common word? Like, something that you see every day that you don't think about. Like, a, uh, uh, oh, well, yeah, I do a lot of walking, so I use a lot of crosswalks. I have no idea what the word for crosswalk is in Spanish. But it's a word that I could reasonably use because I use them all the time. It's like, don't walk cross, don't walk uh, in the crosswalk until you see the 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 man symbol. No camina en el. I don't know the word. Or actually, it also could be la. It's a noun. I don't know what it is. Um, 
And that's frustrating because I would really like to be able to uh, speak Spanish in as many instances as possible, but if I don't know the word, kind of screwed on that now, aren't I? Um, but regardless, uh, Spanish is something that I want to use in the future. I mean, chances are I will use it in my job. Like, I, If you remember from the very first episode I talked about, it's like, oh, it would be my dream job to be a legislator. <laughs> uh, and the big point of knowing another language is that it helps you reach out to more people. Uh, now, if you've been watching some of the presidential coverage for a while, you know that there's plenty of politicians who use it in a pandering way. Cory Booker and uh, Beto O'Rourke. Uh, those are a couple who are long gone out of the 2020 Democratic presidential primary who pandered using Spanish uh, in the Democratic debates. And that's not, that's not how I'd want to use it. I would want to use it in actually forming like a, hey, I'm going to have a Spanish spoken only town hall event because I have a ton, because I have Hispanic constituents that I want to reach out to, right? That's a, to, to me at least, maybe I'm wrong. Um, that feels like a very different scenario than um, I'm going to give my grandstanding talking points here on stage where I'm pointing with my thumb, because that's the finger that people point with, um, And I, but I'm going to say my can talking point uh, in uh, Spanish right now to you, uh, because uh, I want to make sure that I know those Hispanics are coming out for me. Uh, that, that's what I'm envisioning in a... Uh, pandering person's mind when they do that. Uh, but I'm getting a little bit off track here. Even like, I mean, let's say I'm, I don't end up being a legislator, right? Let's say I end up working for a company that could relevant, that would, that would care about me having a political science degree. Knowing another language makes me a more desirable candidate. And I should receive a little bit more money every year because it's like, oh, great, you know another language. You can work with more people who also know that language. Here's a little bit more money for doing that, right? That's perfect. It's a great reason to uh, know another language. Um, oh, excuse me. Ooh, just had a little... Uh, <laughs> uh, gas there. It almost came up. <laughs> um... What about some other uses? Maybe a, a Spanish creative outlet podcast? Uh, I don't know. Maybe like maybe if I were in a scenario where I had enough to free time to re-record the creative outlet podcast in Spanish, I would be willing to do it. But the odds are, shock and surprise, I will not have uh, the time to take the English podcast and redo it uh, in Spanish. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, another one of the people that I like, you know, I brought up, uh, obviously earlier I talked about Cinema Massacre. It's a very entertaining channel. I've talked about, uh, I think on the first, well, I've talked about uh, Pat Nian of the CU podcast. Uh, we talked about Kyle Kalinske, his secular talk. But another one of the people I like is uh, David Pakman. Now, he's a bit of a weird guy. I don't know if... I, I wouldn't say I like him entirely if you're purely talking politics and style because he definitely gets into that sort of uh, high-minded academic mode sometimes. At least that's what I've seen. You know, I can get into him here and there. It's not like I, I hate the guy. It's not that I think he's terrible. Um, and regardless of... Uh, whether you, you agree with his politics, that's really not what is important to me here. I, I'm just bringing him up because you wouldn't know it, but he's from Argentina. He was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, and he mentions that on the show. That's why I'm okay with bringing it up. Um, and so he's brought up on a number of occasions uh, the idea of broadcasting his show in Spanish. But the thing is, there's a, there's a lot of hoops to jump through to make 
uh, uh, shows like this and shows like his um, in the same quality as what you get in English. And, you know, I feel much the same way. It's like, I don't have the time to re-record what I'm doing here. And I've already spent, if I look at the timer here, it's been an hour and five minutes, which is, which is actually quite a bit shorter than the last two episodes, but that's beside the point. Uh, I don't really have the time to re-record that hour in Spanish. And, you know, translation bots that dub over what you're talking aren't really up to snuff yet to be a good alternative because they just don't sound human like how would you like to hear the uh, and like let's just say i was recording this in spanish right and i was like oh maybe i should release it in english it's like how would you like to hear the english robotic version talking over me like this and trying to keep up with what my mouth is saying that would not be very enjoyable uh, now, would it? And uh, I can't really foresee anybody out there who wants to uh, dub my work in Spanish, but you know what? If there is someone, that would be really, really, really cool. And I mean, yeah, I could put subtitles, but subtitles I've always found are never as enjoyable as just being able to, honest to goodness, listen to the piece. Because that's I mean, that is half of the sensory detail of a video, and in this case, the entire sensory detail of a podcast is the speaking, right? Uh, so I, I can't foresee it. Entonces, no creo que vaya a producir mi podcast en español en el futuro. Lo siento. Uh, but yeah, that's that, that, that's my uh, one non-gaming segment from this podcast. At least one quarter of the podcast has to be about something other than gaming, and today I thought it should be Spanish. So I think I'm about ready to uh, wrap this up here. Uh, let's see... Let me just check if there's any other notes. I don't think there's anything else. It should just be my wrap-up stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, otherwise, I don't really have much else I want to talk about here today. Actually, there is one other thing. Uh, so, one piece of feedback that I've received from some... from uh, my lady friend who's watched a couple of these is that I should try to incorporate more B-roll. So that's obviously something you've been seeing throughout this whole segment now, haven't you? Um, which is great. I think it's very important to make sure that there is B-roll in uh, these uh, segments here, because otherwise you're just staring at my face during the entire time, and that can get kind of boring if you're looking at this video-wise. Now, if you're just listening to the audio, then I guess B-roll doesn't really matter. Um, but, you know, gotta provide that visual variety. That's uh, half the fun of making videos, is the editing, in my opinion. I quite enjoy editing, to be honest. Um, and, you know, I guess... Obviously, this episode took quite a bit longer to make, than the last two, which is frustrating to me. But like I said, I would rather have episodes go up once they are ready to be recorded, once they are completely edited, than have me try to, oh, I gotta, I gotta get four topics, I gotta talk about them, we gotta edit them, uh, and then the whole thing just kind of sucks. Um... I mean, in this case, this podcast still, like, every podcast so far has gotten progressively shorter. So hopefully I can do my best to keep them a relevant length. I mean, I'm sure people like the shorter uh, outcome, or the outcome, that's not the word. The shorter uh, final product. How about that? The shorter final products. You know, if that's what you want, great. Glad I can provide that. Um... I just hope I, I, I just prefer doing them an hour and a half at least. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm just doing my best to make sure that these segments are able to go up in between episodes so that there's some stream of content out there. Because, you know, even if you prefer to listen to the whole episode the first time, right? Uh, 
I figure that having the segments is just a nice format to let you make a custom playlist of what I talk about, where it's like, eh, you know, that, uh, that, uh, collecting segment, eh, not really all that interesting. I don't know if that's the case, I'm just bringing it out as an example, and I like all the work I make, so I would not call it uninteresting, but that's just me. Uh, but on the other hand, you might be like, ooh, that, uh, that, uh, scalping segment was really good, and I want to save it to this playlist, so when I'm in the mood to listen to the, the Creative Outlet podcast, I could just have that one on cue right away. Um... You know, it's best of both worlds. Those who prefer to only listen to what they want can hear it right away. Um, and those who, and, you know, that all they have to do is wait for the, uh, re- the, wait for the segment to come out. Or you can just listen to the whole thing right here, right now, uh, that I have finished recording it and then I'm, uh, edit it all into one giant piece. Um, so yeah, I think that's about everything I need to say here today. Uh, As always, thank you very much for listening to what I have to say. Uh, Please do any of the typical engagement type things. That could be liking, that could be uh, providing a subscription, uh, leaving some sort of commentary uh, below the video. Uh, I will see you in the next episode. Uh, I am Brandon Puddle of the Creative Outlet Podcast, signing out here. Thank you. (music) Thank you.